Hello everyone, today we will be talking about edema and heart failure. The commonest answer that you will hear that edema occurs in heart failure because of increased venous pressure and fluid overload. However, there are many other processes going on which help propagate this edema and we will dwell into each one of them. One of the things that you have to understand that edema does not becomes clinically apparent until the interstitial volume has increased by 2 to 3 liters because tissues constituting the interstitium can easily accommodate several liters of fluid and the patient weight may increase by nearly 10% before pitting edema is evident. In heart failure, there are two types of failures, backward and forward. In backward failure, there is venous congestion resulting in fluid accumulation in interstitium, resulting in plasma volume depletion, resulting in stimulation of your sodium and water retention. And in forward failure, there is underfilling of arterial circulation because of reduced cardiac output, resulting in activation of neurohormonal responses and therefore sodium and water retention. This is the Frank Starling curve. The red line shows the stroke volume and the blue line shows the venous return and the point of contact is your stroke volume at a given venous return. In heart failure, as your Frank Starling curve gets depressed, your stroke volume for a given venous return decreases and your body has to retain salt and water to improve the venous return and get back to its original stroke volume. Heart failure results in activation of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, sympathetic nerve system and antidiuretic hormone. Function of all these is to increase salt and water reabsorption to improve your cardiac output. However, excessive salt and water retention will stimulate your net uretic peptide system which will tend to oppose this excessive salt and water retention. So let's see what happens in kidneys. In kidneys, because of low perfusion pressure and renal congestion, there is a decreased renal blood flow which is sensed by your JG apparatus and secretes renin. And this stimulates your angiotensinogen to angiotensin 2 pathway. Angiotensin 2 is the most important peptide in this event. It causes sodium retention in proximal convoluted tubule. It also stimulates your adrenal glands to produce aldosterone and which further results in sodium and water retention from your collecting ducts. Angiotensin 2 also stimulates your sympathetic output which helps further reabsorb sodium in the proximal convoluted tubules. It can also stimulate some ADH secretion and thirst mechanism. And with sympathetic output, it causes vasoconstriction to maintain the perfusion pressures. All this results in salt and water retention. This salt and water retention stimulates your atria and because of atrial wall distension, this wall distension stimulates production of your natriuretic peptides which opposes the effect of RAS and sympathetic nervous system. However, in heart failure, these are highly elevated but their effect seems to be very attenuated and research is ongoing to figure out why. These peptides are metabolized by your peptidases and proteases into inactive natriuretic peptide. We'll see in a different lecture how manipulating this pathway can help manage your heart failure patient better. Let's see the effect of heart failure on Starling forces. In the previous lecture, we understood that your precapillary sphincter controls the precapillary pressure. However, on the venous end, there is no such sphincter. Therefore, the pressure in the central venous system is easily transmitted to the capillaries. So in heart failure, your precapillary rises as your central venous pressure increases. This increases your hydrostatic pressure gradient, thereby increasing the amount of filtrate that is made in these capillaries. Because of the stretch of these capillaries, your hydraulic permeability coefficient also increases so as to increase the net filtration. Lymphatics in these tissues stand as a guard against this increased filtration by increasing their flow up to 10 to 20 times. However, if they are overwhelmed by increased net filtration, edema can occur in these places. In kidneys, the effect of Starling forces is felt by Bowman capsule and your renal tubules. In renal tubules, because of increased central venous pressure, you have more congestion because of increased hydrostatic gradient. This results in increase your interstitial pressure in the kidneys and this is also transmitted to your Bowman space which counteract the filtration pressure from the capillaries. All this congestion results in compression of renal tubules and increase tubular fluid pressures. 
This stimulates renin angiotensin system and further results in salt and water retention and increased congestion. Understand that kidneys have low compliance because they are encapsulated, so the pressure rise in the kidneys is much faster. All this will affect your kidneys in multiple ways. There will be decreased cortical and medullary blood flow, decreased GFR, and decreased washout of solutes from medulla, and all this will result in decreased urine output and renal failure. So the initial effect of renal congestion is salt and water retention, which will further worsen your congestion. And as your congestion worsens, your renal output decreases and you develop renal failure. This is also known as cardiorenal syndrome. Another aspect of heart failure which is overlooked is increase in intra-abdominal pressures. Because of fluid overload, you develop abdominal wall edema and visceral edema along with ascites. And this would result in reduction of renal blood flow due to compression of renal arteries and elevation of parenchymal and renal vein pressures. And this will stimulate your renin angiotensin system as well. Let's look at the edema formation in some other organs. In soft tissues and muscles, you have continuous capillaries which have high reflection coefficient. And in these places, your glycocalyx has very important role which limits the amount of filtration from these capillaries. Because of these venous pressures, your capillary pressures are high and this results in more hydrostatic gradient. For every 1 mm change in this pressure gradient, filtration increases by 6.67. If you remember, the average net flow in these areas is around 2 ml per minute. Fluid will accumulate more in your dependent areas because of gravity and in the areas of high compliance because your change in interstitial pressure will be much slower. This is the reason why you see a lot of edema in the scrotal sac in spine position in these patients. In the lungs, your capillary pressure are determined by your left-sided pressure rather than your right-sided pressures. Also, these capillaries are much more leaky with lower reflection coefficient. The glycocalyx has limited role in these places because of high permeability. If you remember from my previous lecture, there is more blood flow to the central areas of the lungs as compared to the peripheral areas and more blood flow to the base than apex. This results in the typical bat wing appearance that you see on your chest x-ray. Gut also has very leaky capillaries with low reflection coefficient and they have high interstitial oncotic pressure as well. These are well suited to reabsorption of proteins and carbohydrate molecules. Your gut has high compliance, thereby making it more prone to edema. However, these are rich in lymphatic drainage because of their function. So edema formation happens much later. In liver, your capillary pressures are much lower than other organs because the blood flow is mostly from your portal side. However, increase in central venous pressure can increase your capillary pressures. These capillaries are very leaky with very high permeability and the interstitial oncotic pressure is almost similar to your plasma oncotic pressures. Because of low compliance of liver, the intrahepatic pressure can rise pretty rapidly. However, it is well entrenched with lymphatics, which increase their flow, thereby minimizing this increase in pressure. However, in advanced heart failure, you can see congestive hepatopathy, which you can observe in your lab test by looking at your elevated transaminases levels. Because of gravity, the pressure of the water column is transmitted from vein into the capillaries, thereby increasing your peak capillary and increasing your filtration rates. In heart failure, because of elevated venous pressure and malfunctioning lymphatics, filtration remains in the interstitium, resulting in edema formation. One of the other things that is not talked about much is effect on the lymphatic flow. Research has found that patients with heart failure have reduced capillary surface area along with reduced lymphatic reserves. And as you get more congested, these valves in the lymphatics become more incompetent as the lymphatics dilate. By now, you should have some idea about how edema formation proceeds in heart failure patients. As heart failure progresses, edema develops in dependent areas and more compliant areas and then spreads to non-dependent areas and low compliant areas. Congestion of the kidneys plays most important role in progression of heart failure. In decompensated heart failure, this sets in a vicious cycle of sodium and water retention, which gradually causes more congestion over time, finally resulting in renal failure. 
And once you understand these process, you will be able to understand where your patient is in his course of congestive heart failure, helping you to manage these patients more effectively. Simple ways to reduce edema is to make them lysopine or elevate the affected limb. Better is used to be treatment of heart failure in the past because lying down redistributed fluid from interstitium and venous compartment and this would help your diuresis. This is one of the reasons why you see nocturia in congestive heart failure patients. Walking and moving is very important in these patients. As we understood before, the resting standing venous pressure in the leg is around 80 to 90 millimeters of mercury and the pressure drops to 20 to 30 millimeters with walking and calf exercises. So your muscles help you with venous pumping and lymphatic flow as well. So always make sure that you walk your patient daily and not sit down with the leg dangling down that recliner. On the similar grounds, changing posture of your patients can help improve edema. Compression stockings can sometimes help by increasing your interstitial pressures, thereby counteracting the hydrostatic pressure gradient. To summarize, elevated CVP and low cardiac output and heart failure result in renal congestion, decreased blood flow to the kidneys, and elevation of intra-abdominal pressures. These all result in sodium and water retention from activation of your renin, angiotensin, and aldosterone system and sympathetic nerve system. Elevated capillary pressure from elevated CVP result in excessive filtration from capillary beds and the edema formation will depend upon gravity, that means dependency, tissue compliance, and the type of capillaries. Lymphatics can become more dysfunctional due to distension from edema formation. Limb elevation, walking, and compression stalking can help reduce some of this edema. The methods that we just talked about simply move edema from one organ to another. You have to get rid of salt and water to help improve your patient. So let's talk about this in the next lecture where we'll talk about how to use diuretics and many other ways to help get rid of this. The references are in the link below. Thank you.